Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for everyone who's tuning in. Hope everyone's happy and healthy, uh, whether you're having your afternoon coffee or your dinner or you're just lounging in your sweatpants or on the elliptical. I hope that you've been enjoying this so far and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about our journey for Emma Labs and how we have focused a lot on the feature store within Vanguard. So I'll just take you through where we're at right now. So just an introduction into what MLOps is, and I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing, this has been, um, we're catching like wildfire in advanced analytics space um, in general. And if you think about it, all the way from the left-hand side where you have the data wrangling portion, then you go into the feature where the models then take the derived features and plus the raw data, where you do your training, your validation, and you go over to the automation and deployment. So everything that combines together, everything that's orchestrated in, a, in the efficient, automated manner is what brings the constructs of model ops together. So the for sake of simplicity, I will divide the slide into three major portions. So the first portion is the data ops portion, which is the data wrangling portion, where you need to ensure that you have, of course, everything starts with data, garbage in, garbage out. So you have to ensure your, ensure your data has a thorough quality check. You need to make sure that there, there are certain SLAs you're meeting. And on top of that, then you go into feature, which, it go, which goes hand in hand with it. And in feature is something where the data scientists, the machine learning engineers, they look at the business problem. They try to understand what are the features that they are trying to create for the model. They go through the basic EDA, production of dimensionality. They figure out the feature importance. But they also have to make sure that on an, on an ongoing basis, they're also checking for bias and drifts, et cetera. So that's the data ops portion in model ops. Now, in between, you have the model development as well, where you need to make sure that you have reusable code components. Your definition of done is accounting for model monitoring. You are uh, you're training your, your parameters in a way that are optimized. You're distributing your training, all of that. So all of that needs to also be accounted for, whether you're doing on-prem or on cloud. Now, in, in Vanguard's case, when you move on to deployment, when we were creating the data and the model that we had to deploy, there was a significant amount of rework that we had to do to be able to push it over to the finish line. What we were missing was the true CI CD component of how do you containerize your model and data and how do you push it over to the finish line? And we were severely lacking the microservice architecture. Our change records were taking an inordinate amount of time. Anytime we had to roll something out in production, we had to do a lot of integration testing to make sure nothing was breaking. In short, we did not have automation across the board to, uh, to detect for errors in our pipeline, to detect where our pipeline was breaking, to have a production support system to see if there was a problem in the data or in the features model or the system level. So when we started to pull apart where we were in our maturity, we realized that a lot of the systems were automated and efficient, but together they were not coming as one cohesive ecosystem. Uh, many of our models had monitoring, but we did not have a dashboard to be able to see real time. What was the status of the model? Did we need to retrain them, et cetera? Many times we were shipping out our results because of which we were figuring out that, you know, we need to now roll it back because our clients have seen something in production. So those were the things that we were trying to figure out in model ops. So some of the challenges I already talked about in the previous slide. So this talks about we were severely lacking in our data maturity. Different lines of business in Vanguard were uploading their data on the cloud, following their own best practices. We did not have a common data lake where we were storing everything in an ideal format, which was creating havoc for data engineers and machine learning engineers. We did not have a centralized feature store until now. So we were severely lacking the best practices around feature development lifecycle. We did not have a repository where we could easily search for a particular feature that was conforming to a model. We were not able to aggregate data from structured, unstructured data sources when both of them needed to be able to create a model in action. So it was getting really convoluted for us to create the versioning of the features, to figure out what version of the, the feature was powering the models 
guys. It was all very manual and it was taking a huge amount of time on our, our resources. Um, needless to say, even our modeling development, every time somebody needed to create a model, they were basically starting from scratch. We were lacking a centralized repository where people had the best code written, the, the templates that they could plug and play so that instead of starting from scratch, they were best practices, not just within our department, but even across Vanguard that we could use. And needless to say, even when we were trying to experiment, like we were trying to set up AB experiment, ABC experiment, it was very hard for us to figure out which version of the model is working better. And we were lacking the blue-green deployment in standard state. And how to even roll back to a previous version of the model in case something was not working well in the new one, it was again, very, very arduous of a process. So needless to say, when we were going into deployment, there was no CI CD. We had, a, we, had a, we had obviously continuous integration, but for continuous deployment, our infrastructure was very disjointed. So the department that I am in, we use um, a third party vendor called Domino Data Lab, and we create our model, train our model, update, uh, you know, create our features there. But when we have to deploy, we wanted to hook it up to uh, SageMaker deploy from AWS. We did not want to use the out of the box um, models. We wanted to be able to bring in our own propriety models, be able to create our features, et cetera. So we had to figure out how do we join them. And container was the best solution for us that we are trying to figure out how do we integrate that. So not just that we can in containerize our model, but also data and features when we are productionalizing so that everything goes hand in hand and the right set of features are, are getting uh, deployed with the model. And uh, monitoring was a huge problem and it goes with um, our governance. So recently we have a governance framework that we are trying to put together where we are governing our process end to end, where we exactly know what data is going in, if there's any PII, how are we accounting for the, how are we, how are we redacting that, still maintaining the credibility, the credibility of the data for creating models. How are we monitoring our models in production? How are we monitoring our features in production? And how are we stopping our pipeline from going further if we see something was to go awry in the feature so that we're not going through the entire life cycle of rescoring our models on a regular basis because they're all on the cloud. And if we go down serving our clients and we only to realize that the scores are not usable, we would have also wasted a lot of cost and accumulated a lot of cost in doing that. So how are we having a pulse, a heartbeat on each step of the way from data to features, to model, to deployment? So that was something very critical that we were completely missing as part of a monitoring process. So all of this part need for a jointed system. So when we started to look, take a look at it, we realized that if we focus our design, our attention around feature store, we can solve a lot of these problems because if I think about it, feature store is centrally the heart of what we are creating. It is where the input data comes in. It is the output where the, um, it feeds the data into the models and then it or, or ultimately gets deployed. For us, features are of two types. One is the inputs that are going into the model uh, they are not the raw data sources. Only when we are transforming the data, that's when we call it features, because we have clear demarcation between the lines of businesses that are owning and governing and have the data stewards for the raw data. And then there are features that my team owns and governs. So we want to make sure that we create that separation. And the second feature are the output from our models, the scores that we are producing, because output from one model is also used as input into the another model. So we have to make sure that we are designing our feature store in a way that we are able to account for both input and output. So when we started to take a look at the entire ML Ops, we had to be very intelligent about where should we be focusing our attention? Where should we be investing our energy and resources? So what we did was we started with our feature store. It's called Rubik's Cube. It is an in-house created feature store. Um, it's definitely something that we have been championing and thinking about the design as well. 
Uh, but it was something that we started to use on AWS Cloud. So a lot of the components that were coming together, we were using, uh, we have Spark pipelines, we have Lambda services kicking off the entire workflow orchestration. We have Blue ETL jobs that are operationalizing the scripts that we are reading, pushing it into the feature store. And also we have to make sure that even our feature store have three different environments. So our very first environment is the sandbox. So that's where the machine learning engineers and the data scientists are writing uh, their input, uh, coding the models and the outputs are going. And so that's where the data scientists and engineers have the, it's their playground where they can read and write. The next step of the way in our feature store, the next higher level environment is where we go into staging. That's where we do our monitoring. We put our rigor, we put our governance and risk hat. We have to make sure we have a whole litany of things that we have to follow before we call something in production. So that's where we really iron out our definition of done. And once that's done, then through our um, ETL jobs, then it pushes it over to uh, production. So that's our final feature store where we do not have write access, we can only read from it. And that's also something that our end customers within Vanguard are going to be able to use. And our end customers are other analytical teams so that they can reuse the features. There also are business counterparts who are taking the scores, who are taking the inputs from the AI ML powered insights and integrating with their business application. They might be doing it by a, a badge where they're just like coming in and doing the basic hype query to retrieve it, or they could even just be connecting it via an API to be able to surface it on um, a CRM application, for example. So when we started creating a Rubik's Cube, our feature store, we of course wanted to make sure that we were making it central and so we were making it as a centralized repository so that it was easy for folks to be able to search and reuse the data. We also wanted to make sure that we were standardizing the definition, definition of features like I was talking about. We did not want to replicate all the raw data that we were sourcing from other lines of businesses, but they were going to be our core features that are pertinent to the models that have been validated by the, their use in a model and also something which are derived from the raw sources. So we absolutely needed to standardize the feature definition. Uh, we also had to make sure that we were capturing the lineage, we were capturing the metadata, and we have it integrated with Calibra. That's our metadata catalog. We are also using uh, Calibra as, a metadata, as our storefront to be able to show our various tables, the schema, the business metadata, the technical metadata, that's all related to Rubik's Cube, and it's all easily searchable. The nomenclature is such that if somebody types in uh, a particular type of a feature or a model, they are going to be able to see all of, they are going to be able to see the details of it in Colibra itself. So we have been trying to use Colibra, not just to store metadata, but also to be able to search for our features, to be able to surface our features as well. And when we have been thinking about our feature store, in the true spirit of being able to not just be a SQLite feature store, we wanna make sure we don't treat it as a physical layer, we treat it as a logical layer. And that's where we are being able to aggregate features from uh, structured and unstructured data sources. We are being able to create uh, uh, storage for embeddings as well to point back to the, the data that the embeddings have been derived for. So that again, it's easy for data scientists to be able to search for those embeddings and be able to use them in their model. So that's something that we wanted to make sure. We call that as our hot store. So depending upon the, the data usage, whether it is a graph database, for example, or it is a document storage, or is it just a basic hive table? We wanna make sure that we have a concept of hot store then so that we are customizing where our features go based on how they need to be sourced or what frequency or what scalability is needed and what type of database, sorry, what type of application it's going to be hitting. So those are the thought process behind it that we're keeping in mind while designing our feature store. And the way we have made it easily to easily accessible is we have directly linked it to our access controls within Vanguard. 
So depending upon um, a line of business or a team, et cetera, you're in, it mirrors your existing um, access controls. So that way we do not make it cumbersome on our end users to be able to request for this, uh, the access, to be able to have extra connections on the cloud, connecting our um, uh, buckets, et cetera. And um, we, we, are, we have eliminated so that it's just requesting of a role that gets you the data. So that's like another thing that we have made sure that we incorporate Rubik's Cube as part of our, our, our existing ecosystem. And um, that's how we've also been able to conform to the governance and access protocol that are set by, by Vanguard. Um, and now it's also for us to be able to see who's using it. Are the features we are outputting, are they even useful? Are people pinging against it? How often are they pinging against it? So that can also help analytical teams serve with some KPIs, some technical KPIs in terms of reusability of our features, et cetera. And also to be able to see our, uh, is, our, is our design even fault tolerant? So with the logs and, and errors that we're getting, we can continue to improve our design as well. So we wanted to make sure that we're able to create or generate a report at the end to even show our downstream consumption, our downstream access of the features. So a lot of these components were kept in mind to be able to tackle the, uh, the issues that I, I talked about in the, in the previous slide. So this was a high level design of what Rubik's Cube our feature store is looking like. Um, and lastly, how does it all come together to solve our um, MLOps challenges? The way it does is that when we are taking the data that's going into features, we're only consuming the data that's coming from a goal copy. So we have made it a prerequisite that any of the data that we acquired needs to have data quality check or data report on top of it. We also want to make sure that the data is available on the cloud and is automated. It is in a format that it is easy to plug and play. So we have mandated that to a data management and data ops folks to be able to do it. So that way we do not have to spend an inordinate amount of time in creating features and running our models. And also, we also want to make sure that the raw data itself that we are acquiring has lineage, has metadata mentioned in Calibra. So if there are those data sources that do not have uh, those sort of um, governance around it, we, would, we do not want to be able to entertain that data. The second thing is, we, I was talking in the previous slide about the feature standardization as well. So how, what do we classify as a feature? There was a big myth around the company that the raw data all needs to be copied into our feature store, which is a big no-no, at least in Vanguard. So we wanted to make sure that even the features that we were creating were automated so that we were not relying on manual intervention to be able to create the features. And also there were no two definition of features that were existing in the company or the nomenclature was not differing. So those were the things that we had to make sure that we had created a functional requirements on the standardization of the features themselves. And how do you even handle embeddings? How do you store them? How do you create a, um, a reference for the embedding as to where they're stored? And also when we create features before we deploy them into Rubik's Cube, we've absolutely made it mandatory as part of a definition of done is to have drift and bias checks. Many a times we used to use features that did not have those components built into it. So we had to make sure that we were setting the best practices around that. As part of the MLOps as well, we talked about the deployment of the features. And the way we wanted to deploy the features was not in the old archaic way where a change record was taking a 10 day um, um, lift for us to be able to push a change into production. It was costing us way too much time, way too much money, and the business speed to market was very slow. So we really uh, adopted heavily the use of containers, Contain containerizing our features and models, and how can we truly make it a one-click deploy so that it really makes us to even conduct experimentation. It makes it easy for us to do blue-green deployment with rollback features built into it. So when we were deploying our features into production, we were also making mandatory for our MLOps engineers that they need to create this template for CI/CD batch deployment. 
Um, in Vanguard, we are still designing our online inferencing. That's not what we have working on. We are perfecting our batch for now. And in 2022, we'll be focusing our design on um, real-time online inferencing. And also we have to make sure that the entire feature orchestration deployment was governed by a workflow orchestrator. So for the lack of um, an orchestrator right now, we are being pragmatic to use step functions for, from AWS to be able to orchestrate the workflow and to be able to capture if one event is triggering the other. And if there's, a, if there's an error that's happening, how can we ensure that there are retries built into it or there are alerts built if there's something that was uh, going wrong so that we could have a proactive look at it. So that's another thing that we were taking a look at it. In terms of monitoring, since we are now being asked to be compliant uh, with respect to the governance around our features, around our data, around our model, we also have to make sure that Rubik's Cube design was incorporating the enterprise level guide guidelines to make sure that we are including model, we are constantly producing the performance of the model, we are producing the, the drift and the bias. And in case there was a problem, we were going to stop productionization of that feature. And if you're rescoring our pipelines on a daily or a weekly basis, we want to make sure that we are able to interrupt when we see the problem before the clients are the one who are actually raising their hands and telling us, hey, something's wrong in your score. And then we go back and figure it out. So we really did not want to reverse engineer the problem once it's already occurred. Um, another thing is when we have features and model models that we are deploying in production, we want to make sure that we are having a record of it in our model registry. So for that, we are using a SageMaker model registry where we are storing the metadata for the model itself, where we are capturing the input data, we are capturing what are the checks we are putting on top of it, who's using it, how often are we updating it, when was it last trained and things like that. So we want to make sure that in an enterprise level, any model that's flowing through Rubik's Cube, any feature that's going through Rubik's Cube has its, has, has its name in the registry. So that way, uh, you know, the auditing of our, of our solutions that we are creating does not become um, cumbersome for us and for anyone who wants to take a look at it. And alerts and usage. So we have a very strong production support system that we have created. So all the way from server, if there's a problem in the system, of course, we have uh, logs, et cetera, for our IT teams to take a look at if something has gone down in terms of our database or server or a cluster. So that's absolutely number one. But how can we make sure that we have alerts that are intelligent for us to be able to tell if there's nothing wrong with the system, but it clearly points us out that there is so there's something wrong in the input data at the raw layer itself, or there's something wrong with the feature. So that's been our production support. It's not just our IT team that's accountable or responsible for making sure the system is up and running, but the ML engineers, the data engineers, the data scientists are also in charge of continuously making sure that the model doesn't need to be split open and taken a look at if something is going wrong or the features need to be recoded or anything like that. Um, this was again, something that we were holding our IT teams accountable. And it was again, taking a long time before we were figuring out where actually was the bottleneck. So when we are deploying something in production, this is part of our process excellency that we are putting into place is that when we are um, in charge of anything that's going down in production, it's not just our IT teams, but collaboratively, the ML engineers, data engineers, and data scientists that have worked on it. So this is why we chose Feature Store as our first MVP in our MLOps journey. A lot of these thought process went into the design of the Feature Store. And by setting these guardrails, by setting these definitions of done and best practices, we can then focus, dive deep into the data management or the deployment process and keep making it better and better. But we do not want to just attack the data management process in isolation and monitoring, but bringing it together as part of a feature store was something we thought that was an easier solution to bring these moving parts together. And that's how in our journey of MLOps, where we're at right now, we have our feature store in production. 
We have our data management and ops that we have, uh, we have uh, uh, productionalized, we have a template. And the CICD containers is something where we are trying to work with to bring Domino uh, models that we have trained in, in, in uh, Domino to be able to deploy it in SageMaker uh, batch. So those are the things that we have kept in mind and uh, that's where we are within Vanguard. So that was uh, that was it for me, and uh, I thank you, thank you all, and uh, that's my LinkedIn. So I would love to hear from you as well and connect with some of you there. Thank you. <laughs>